Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Chris, and, and uh, this is, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege for me, it's an honor for me to be here, and thank you for inviting me to speak and to share the Word of God, and, uh, you know, I, I miss the Casimong family. My, my, my dad and uh, Pastor Chris' dad were together as workers uh, in the Lord in Leyte, and uh, I know all of them, and uh, I, I, we're always excited to see and have fellowship again with them. Brother Nev is here, so I was glad to see him. So praise God, okay? And uh, we just uh, we drove from uh, from the Bay Area, coming here, and then tomorrow also we drive back to California. So I'm inviting also Pastor Chris, if you uh, happen to be there in to, to go there in California, then you're invited. You are always welcome in our place and to speak also in our church. I said it's your turn now. Uh, <laughs> to come to uh, the Bay Area and to speak at our church in Trinity Faith Baptist Church. And I would like also to acknowledge some of our members in Haguna Bulacan. Uh, they are also here with me. And uh, I would like to acknowledge them to please stand up. Uh, Brother Rene, uh, Sister Nene, Sister Jan, and Sister uh, Nene, we call him Nene. So thank you so much for uh, coming also here to have fellowship with us. And, Thank you for your warm welcome, and though it's cold outside, uh, thank you so much. And um, uh, I was in Bulacan, I've been a pastor for 15 years in Bulacan uh, after graduating from the seminary. And then here at the, at the Trinity Baptist Church, I've been a pastor for uh, 13 years uh, already. So I'm 27 years as a pastor. I'm still young, okay? And they still call me Piolo. Uh, <laughs> don't worry. Okay, so uh, one member of the church uh, uh, approached me one day and after the preaching and he said, Pastor, I like your sermon, I like your preaching. And I said, oh, what part of the, of the message uh, did you like? And he said, uh, when it was finished. <laughs> I like it when it was finished. So, I, I hope that you will like the message when it's done. Okay? So, I, Pastor Chris, did not tell me uh, how, how many minutes or how many hours I'm supposed to speak here. Uh, but don't worry, we're going to be finished uh, this day. Today, uh, when I'm done. And uh, when we had our communication, he assigned me a text. And uh, because you have a series on hard uh, sayings of Jesus, okay? And he assigned me the text in Matthew chapter 20, the saying of, uh, so the first will be last, and those who are last will be first. So I'm going to speak on, is God unfair, okay? Is God unfair? And thank you, Pastor Chris, for that uh, prayer. But first, I introduce to you my family. Okay, this is my family. We only have one son, and... Uh, He's, uh, he's serving in the United States Air Force, and he's not with us, he's in, in Langley, in Virginia. So, I think this was taken uh, two years ago, this, uh, this uh, picture. So, I just would like to introduce my family. So, of course, yeah, Debbie, my wife. And, uh, well, let's go to the message, this God unfair. Uh, those who are first will be last. There are some people who are last, they will be first. And there's one thing that I've observed. If I, if I were to ask you, uh, do you know the location where the first Starbucks uh, store you know, located? Yellow. Yes. Wow. And it was yellow, okay? And do you know the last Starbucks store that they established or they put up? The last one. Do you know? See, you know only the first Starbucks, okay? So, when I sign this verse uh, for me, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. That's in Matthew 20, 16. But did you know that if, if you're reading your Bible, this is only the second time that Jesus mentioned this verse. There was the first time in chapter 19, verse 30, okay? Before this parable of the workers in the vineyard. But Jesus reversed the statement. He said, so the first, okay, will be last, and the last will be first. So, you're right. 
On our way here, we passed by Starbucks in Seattle, okay? The first store of Starbucks, but you don't know the... If you ask me, Pastor, what's this last Starbucks? I don't know, I swear, okay? I don't know. <laughs> but another question, if I were to ask you, who was the first man to walk on the moon? The first man? Yes, you're right. Neil Armstrong. Another question. Who was the last man to walk on the, on the moon? Because there were only 12 people who were able to walk on the moon. The last person was in 1972. Okay? But who was the last person to walk on the moon? You don't know? But you were the first person, right? The last person was Eugene Sarnan. The last person to walk on the moon. Now, why did I ask these questions? Because there's something about being first. Many people, they remember this, many people remember about the first person, the first, it's always the first, but many people don't remember the last. And that's why Jesus said, oh, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. There's something about this statement. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, the series is about hard sayings of Jesus. But let me tell you, it's not really hard because it's grace. It's about the grace of God. Now the context of this passage, okay, in, the, in this parable, the context, well, we, we've studied hermeneutics. You have to look at the context to get the message of the parable. Now the context of this parable is in the previous chapter. Because this parable was connected by the other statement, the hard saying of Jesus. Okay. In chapter 19, the last verse. So you have to look at the previous story, and that is the story of the rich young ruler. So what's the context of this? Now, this, the context of this parable was in response to the question of Peter. When Jesus mentioned about the rich man, the rich young ruler, and then the only person who encountered Jesus who went away sad because of his riches. Okay. And then Jesus said, well, it's easier for the covenant to go through the eye of the needle than, to reach, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Peter replied, Lord, he said, we have left everything to follow you. What then will be, will be there for us? We have left everything. And so Jesus said, well, don't worry, Peter, okay? Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. Jesus is saying here, when you left everything, you don't lose anything. You didn't lose anything because you invested all these things. And Jesus said that he's saying basically the rich young ruler, maybe in the eyes of many people, they are the first because of their riches, because of their wealth. They are the first, but let me tell you, Peter, one day they will become last if they're willing to give up their wealth. But in the last days, you may be considered last today because you gave up everything, but someday you're going to be first because of what you're going to receive from me. Because he said, because you will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. You will receive many good things and most of all, you will inherit eternal life. Wow! So Jesus started the parable. In, in chapter 20. So this is a contrast now. Jesus contrasts grace and fairness. Okay? Grace and wages. Now, grace reveals the goodness of God. But wages reveals human effort. It's about what I'm going to do. Remember, the rich young ruler, he approached Jesus and he said, Master, what must I do? Remember the word do. What must I do to get eternal life? For him, it's about doing something to get eternal life. 
But Jesus said, okay, you're rich, okay. Do you know the commandments? And he said, oh, I know them, but I kept all of them since I was young. And Jesus said, okay, sell everything you have and give to the poor, all your wealth, and then follow me. So you see, what must I do? Jesus said, it's not about doing, follow me, because it's not about religion. Doing something to earn eternal life is religion. Jesus said, follow me, because it's not about doing something, it's about what's being done. Follow me, because it's about a relationship. And you will receive many good things and eternal life. So this parable in chapter 20 represents grace. Sandwiched by chapter 19, verse 30. Many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So in this parable, I think oh, I, nobody has read the, the, the passage, okay? I will read to you the chapter, uh, chapter 20, okay? If you have your Bibles with you, please open to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1. Okay? Matthew, by the way, is located, is, you can find it between Genesis and Revelation, if you... After verse 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has heard us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the ones who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Praise God. That's the word of God. Now, in this parable, in verse 1, the first group of people, they agreed, okay, to receive a denarius. That's a one-day salary or wage of a worker. But then, the others, those 9 a.m. workers, the 12 noon workers, the 3 p.m. workers, and also the last, the 5 p.m. workers. They also received the denarius, but the difference is not about the time of the work, how long they worked. The difference was about the term of the agreement. Now the first group, they agreed on the term, okay? What? Okay, a denarius for one day. But the other groups, the term was that they did not negotiate about a, a, a one-day, you know, pay. The owner said, I will pay you what is right. But remember, what is right is not determined by the wage-based society. Because if you base on what the society, you know, uh, gives, how, how much is the minimum here in Canada? I don't know. Okay. 
12 dollars, okay? That's a, that's a society-based wage. But what is right is not determined by the society. What is right is determined by the owner, by the employer. So that's the difference. Now the question is this, do you think it's, un it's unfair for those early workers to just receive the denials? Do you think it's unfair? Or maybe you'll say, yes, Pastor, it is unfair. It is unfair if you look at it by the word standard. But that's not how the kingdom of God operates. That's not how the kingdom of God works. It's not a web-based kingdom. It's about the grace, what is right. Okay? So, the world will pay you based on your service. But the kingdom of God will give you what is about grace, about what is right. Remember the definition of grace and mercy? Grace is giving you what? What you don't deserve. This late workers, they don't deserve a denarius, right? But they receive what is right. That is grace. Mercy is when God doesn't give you what you deserve. All of us, we deserve hell. All of us, we deserve condemnation and punishment. But God did not give us what we deserve. But when grace works, God will give us what we don't deserve. Remember, in verse 1, Jesus started the story by saying, For the kingdom of God is life. So, the parable is not about the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world operates on fairness. Okay? But the kingdom of heaven doesn't operate on fairness. So the question is, is God unfair? Many Christians would answer, Yes, Pastor, it's unfair. Now, let me ask you the question. Do you, God, do you want God to be fair to you? And many Christians would say, Yes, I want God to be fair to me. But let me tell you, God is unfair. Because if God is fair, then all of us will go to hell. Because that's fair. That's the way it is. But because God is unfair, He gives us more. And that is grace. Amen? Amen. The heaven, the kingdom of God has different mathematics. Okay? The kingdom of God operates in what we call paradox. Do you know what paradox is? In the dictionary.com, when I, when I look at the definition of paradox, paradox means a statement that seems self-contradictory or contrary to the commonly accepted opinion, but in reality expresses the possible truth. So I like this definition. Contrary to commonly accepted opinion, but in reality expresses possible truth. No. There are so many, the, the hard sayings that, that the year series, they're called, most of them they're called paradox. Okay? For example, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. That's a paradox, okay? Anyone who wants to uh, save his life will lose it. But if you want to lose your life for my sake, then you will keep it. That's a paradox, okay? Now, because this is God, how God operates in this parable, now he shared about the operation, how grace operates. The title in your Bibles, okay, in that section is called the, the workers or the parable of the workers in the vineyard. But what about making another title for that? Maybe we can entitle that with the parable of the gracious owner. Or the parable of the gracious master. Okay? Or the parable of the gracious employer. Now in this parable we can learn four things about God's grace. Okay? And I, I love to read alliterations or acronyms. So I, uh, I made an outline. Uh, N-L-A-C. <laughs> New Life Alliance Church. So there are four things that we learn about God's grace. First, the grace of God never expires. Amen? Amen? It never expires. Why? If you look at verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. But, the, but yet, he, he hired many workers until 5 in the afternoon. So if you're late, you're in the afternoon group, you're still in. Okay? Because his grace never expires. Now, 
in what group do you belong? You're in the 5 p.m. worker, the 5 p.m. group, or you're in the 9 or the 6 a.m. group? There's so many Christians, you know, started in their Christian life early. I started in the Christian life early. I was born in a Christian family. Uh, maybe I'm in the 6 a.m. group. Some of you are in the 5 p.m. group. But you're never late, okay? You're never late because God's grace never expires. Now, it doesn't matter when you came to know the Lord as your Savior and began to serve Him at an early age or in old age. His grace never expires because God's gift never expires. You know, during my last, uh, on my last birthday in, in April, Coles, I don't know if there's Coles department store here, okay? Coles department store sent me a gift, a, a gift card. Okay? A $10 for my birthday. And then when I claim it, I didn't, I didn't realize that there's an inspiration to that gift. So, it says here, see? $10 promotional gift for my birthday. But then it says promotional offer valid April 1 to 30. And then when I come, I said, hey, I, I complain. I said, is there an inspiration to a gift? Do you think there's an inspiration to a gift? I believe there's an inspiration, but it's a, oh, sir, it's a promotional gift. <laughs> God doesn't say, sorry, you're already 80 years old, my grace has expired. <laughs> Lord, I want to serve you, even if I'm 90 years old. God doesn't say, you're already 90, you cannot serve me, my grace has expired. No. You know, when I was in Hapune in Bulacan, when I was pastoring, when there are people, when, when there are people who are dying, okay, who are dying, instead of the people calling the priest, they call me for the last rites. Even if this person is an unbeliever. So I go there and then pray for them and then, of course, I, if this person can still respond, then I will ask him to receive the Lord as his Lord and Savior. And then they would receive the Lord. They will pray the sinner's prayer. And then, the day after, they pass away. So I became popular in our area. Oh, this pastor is, if, if you have a loved one who is dying, so just call the pastor, okay? <laughs> but I said, that, I said, it's not late, okay? But I have a note for you, a reminder. Yes, God's grace never expires if you're still alive. But when you die without receiving the Lord and without putting your trust in Him, then there's no grace period after you die. His grace never expires while you're still alive, while you're still living. You know, even if you serve the Lord late, well, it's never late. But you're still a winner. You receive the Lord and serve Him. You're 80, you're 90, you're still a winner. You know what? The warriors. Hey, you like the story about the warriors? Okay. Before the finals, the last, you know, during the playoff, the last opponent was the Houston Rockets. The last two games, game six and game seven, it's almost identical. Third quarter or first half, they're down by about 10. But in the third quarter, they got back and won the game. Brothers and sisters, life is just like that. Maybe Satan is winning in your life for the first quarter and the second quarter of your life. But don't worry, there's still third quarter. There's still fourth quarter. You can still be a winner. Amen? Amen. Because God's grace never expires. And last, second, second thing. God's grace leads to intimacy. Not only that it never expires, it leads to intimacy. Why? Look at verse 9. It says, The workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came, and each received a denarius, a day's wage. So all workers received a denarius. So the question is, what is our denarius? Is it your wage? Now we have to go back to chapter 19 again. Because remember, these two stories are connected. 
If you go back to chapter 19, in verse 29, Jesus again said, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive, okay? A hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. So this is our ordinarius for me. This is ordinarius. You will inherit eternal life. Now, so the red young ruler wanted eternal life, remember? He asked Jesus or Master, what shall I do? What must I do to get eternal life? And the question is, what is eternal life? Is it living forever? Eternal life is heaven? Eternal life is defined by Jesus in John chapter 17 verse 3. During the high priestly prayer in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he went to the cross, he prayed his prayer to the Father in John chapter 17. And he defined eternal life. He said, he prayed, now this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life is about knowing God. Now to know here in Greek is ginosko. Ginosko has many meanings, but in this contra, in this in this context, ginosko is used for intimate relationship. So it says that they know you. So eternal life is about knowing God. It's about having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in Matthew chapter one, the word the ginosko in Greek is being used. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep. Then as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him, his wife, and did not know her. Okay, that's from the New King James Version. Did not know Mary till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, again the word know in King James is used. Now, it's Ginosko. What? He did not know her? But we know in the other translation. Joseph did not have sexual relation with Mary yet. And then Jesus was born. It's about intimate relationship. In the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 4, the word no again is being used. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore him. Now in Hebrew it's Yeda. Yeda also has many meanings, but in this context it's used as intimate relationship. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. So you don't know the definition of knew or knowing, okay? It's about intimate relationship. Eternal life, brothers and sisters, is the relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a relationship. If you go to Luke chapter 23, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, when he was there hanging on the cross with these two things, criminals, and then one of them said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Now, What's your focus in that verse? What do you focus on in that verse? Do you like paradise? Is it eternal life being in a paradise? Well, for me, when I look at this verse, I focus on with me. Because relationship and eternal life is eternal life is having an intimate relationship with Jesus. Eternal life is not about the destination. It's about a relationship. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry, I have this uh, allergy on our way here. He said, Oh, I, need, I, I have to preach, so I have to keep on bringing water. One member of our church gave us a frame. Who is this? It's Charlie Brown, right? And the caption said, in life, it is not where you go, it's who you travel with. I like it. My wife and I, we love to drive. And I always say, when we go to Budika Bay, let's not focus on the destination. Let's enjoy the journey. 
Let's enjoy our time together. If we get there and it's foggy, no worry. Because we're together. Eternal life is not living forever. Eternal life is living forever with God. Do you love to be, do you want to live forever? <coughs> it depends. What if you live forever in hell? Excuse me. This parable, remember, this parable is not about working for your eternal life. It is about the grace of God. God gives grace and gifts. In Romans chapter 6, if you want wages, this is what you get. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Thirdly, God's grace annihilates grumbling. Look at verses 9 to 11. The workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received the denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the land owner. So the 12 hour worker grumbled because the owner showed gratitude to the late workers. Let me ask you this question. What if you bought a house here in Canada, a three bedroom house in Canada for a million dollars? And then Pastor Chris bought also a three bedroom house in the same neighborhood, but he bought it just $500. How would you react? <laughs> How would you react? Would you say, that's unfair, Pastor. That's unfair. I paid a million dollars and then you just get, you just got by 500, 500 dollars. It's unfair. Or we will say, oh, Pastor, I'm so happy for you. If you say it's unfair, you're humble. And that's the problem with us. When we compare with others, when we compare our blessings with others, two things will happen. It's either you become arrogant or you become envious. When you're better than others, you become arrogant. When other people have many blessings or more blessings than you, then you become envious. And that's the reason why many people, as someone said, that many people, they buy things they don't need with money they don't have to impress people they don't like. <laughs> and that is envy. That's dangerous. Our problem is that we compare with other Christians. We compare our blessings with their blessings. And we grumble. Many of us have been Christians for many years. And the temptation for us is that we must overcome the temptation to grumble. You know, we grumble when a new believer came in the church and they're more blessed. God, I've been serving you for many years. Why, why is this person, this new believer, is, they, he received more blessings? What about me? That's the same with Peter, right? That's why Jesus shared this parable. And in our church, the Trinity Faith Baptist Church, every Sunday, we feed homeless people. So we have potluck every Sunday. And then I told our, our brothers and sisters there, he said, okay, we must be open to the homeless. So every Sunday, they come. And they just eat. They don't attend church. They know the time, of the, the end of the service, and then lunch time. So lunch time. They go to church, and then they, I said, let's have them eat and dine with us. Instead of having, uh, this is your location, this is your place. So, let's have fellowship with them. And then people complain, Pastor, the smell. 
And I said, don't worry, you smell it only today. Tomorrow there's no more smell like that, okay? Don't worry. Because they always complain, Pastor, you know. And I said, and I asked them, do you think Jesus will welcome these people here in this church? And of course they answered, there's Pastor. And second question, who owns this church? Of course, Pastor, God, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. So praise God, we don't own this church. <laughs> I said, don't grumble, okay? Don't grumble. Because the grace of God annihilates grumbling. Amen? Amen. When God is more graceful, is when God gives more blessings to your brothers and sisters, be happy, okay? Be happy for them. And lastly, the grace of God confirms His sovereignty. It confirms His sovereignty. You know, in this parable, when the employer shows grace, you know, to the late comers, the, 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 the first workers, the first group workers complain. They grumble. You know what? It only confirms that God is sovereign. That God, you know, has the right to do what He wants to do with His wealth. With his blessings. Amen? And that's, that, that's the response of the Lord Jesus. He said, do I, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Remember, Jesus said, hey, it's my money. You know, you know the commercial? It's my money. And I need it now. Jesus said, it's my money. And if I'm generous, so what? It's my money. I own everything. I have the right to do what I want to do with my money. He's sovereign. And remember, we go back to the context. Chapter 19, verse 27. Peter said, we have left everything to follow you. What then will, they, will be there for us? And remember that I told you that maybe this rich man is the first, he's first because of his riches, but someday Peter, he'll be first because of what I'm going to give you. Brothers and sisters, if you decide, if we decide to follow Jesus and we are willing to give up everything, there's still more. There's blessing. Amen. And then we remember when Peter said we gave up everything, Lord, when we found you. We go back to Luke chapter 5 when Jesus called them as his disciples. Remember, they left their nets. They caught a large number of fish. Just imagine. Maybe this, it was the first time for them to, to catch this you know, large number of fish. But then the Bible says, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Just imagine the moment of success. At the moment of success, when they caught a large number of fish, the Bible says they left everything and they followed Jesus. This is my challenge to every one of us, brothers and sisters in the world. God is gracious. You have been blessed. Are you blessed? Yes. We are blessed by God. To be here in Canada, it's already a blessing. Okay? But my challenge for you is this. Are you willing to let go of everything you have if Jesus would ask you to let go of them? And let me remind everybody that when we receive God's blessing, don't hold on to it. Don't hold on to it. Because those people who hold on to their, to their wealth and their riches, just like this rich young ruler, it's hard for them to let go of the stuff. Because they're holding on to it. So just loosen your grip of your wealth, of your blessings. Because when God asks you, hey, I want to ask, I want to get that blessing from you because I want to give that to somebody else. Do you believe that if you're not holding on to your stuff, 
it's less painful when God remove it from you. And there's no tug of war between you and God. I remember this story about men in Africa who cut animals for zoos in America. They said that one of the hardest animals to cut are the retailed monkeys. The Zulus in the continent, however, it's simple for them. They just use a melon as a trap. Because these monkeys, they're, they're for, they're, they're, the seeds of the melon are a favorite of these monkeys. So the Zulus, what they do, they just cut a hole in the melon. Large enough for the monkey to insert his hand to reach the seeds of the melon. So the monkey would just stick his head in the melon and then grab as many seeds as he can and then withdraw it. This he cannot do. You know why? Because his fist is now larger than the hole, grabbing the seeds. So the monkey would just tug and pull and fight the melon for hours. And he could be free only if he would release the seeds. But the monkey would love to fight and grab the seeds and get the seeds. And then the Zulus, these people, would just grab the monkey and cut them. That's how they cut the monkey. And I like that story because it also illustrates when we grab and hold on to our stuff and all the blessings, when God asks you, hey, I want you to release those blessings. Release those blessings so that you will be free. Many people today are enslaved by their riches, by their wealth. And they could not follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But when Peter and other disciples, when they left their net, nets, they decided, hey, Wow, just imagine the miracle. If I follow this master, if I follow this Jesus, I'd rather follow him because there's blessing with him. There's still more, there's still more blessing when we follow him. Maybe Jesus is asking you today, I want you to follow me and leave your nets. Now, I'm not saying you become a pastor, okay? It's just about saying, it, what I'm saying is that, are you willing to let go? Because God is looking at our heart. He's looking at your heart. Are you willing to let go of all those things to follow me? And if you say, Lord, I'm willing to let go of all these things, then Jesus will say, okay. Yes, it's true that you cannot serve God and money, but you can serve God with money. I want you to serve me. But Pastor Press and me, we left everything and followed the Lord. And we're willing to let go. And we're willing to go wherever God wants us to go. Some pastors, they pray to God, God, I'm willing, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go as long as it's in the United States or Canada. <laughs> I am willing to go wherever. Brothers and sisters, two things, two applications. First, the grace of God is available. If you have not received yet the grace of God in your life, do it now. While there's a chance. Second, if you're following the Lord right now, are you willing to let go of the things that God is asking you to let go of? To follow Him then blessings welcome. God bless you. Thank you.